Well, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for tuning in online. And as you can see, I'm not Pastor Rick. Pastor Rick and Miss Joy were able to get away real quick before we get ready to uh, launch an awesome, finish this series, launch a new series, launch City Groups. They're excited to be here. They're excited to be back for that and took advantage of just a little bit more time here in this moment. And Pastor Dan and I are going to be continuing on in the service that, in the series that Pastor Rick started at the beginning of the year for us. And Pastor Rick, he's taken us on a journey here. We've been looking at Hebrews 12. And in this journey, first of all, we're talking about running this race, this race that is the Christian life, this race that is yours and my faith. And he talked about what does it look like for us? What is the why for us to run this race? Anyone can run this race. And he says there, in Hebrews, it talks about that others have run the race before us. There are the examples that we can look toward that say that you and I can end up running this race and are encouraged to do that. And then he taught us how to prepare for this race. We have to take the extra weights that we have. We have to take the sins in our lives and we have to lay them aside and move forward, be able to run without the resistance that those things bring. This morning, Pastor Dan and I, we're going to end up taking the next step in this journey. We're going to talk about how do we run. It's ready, set, now we're going to go. And what does that look like on how we run? So we are going to start by reading this passage that this series is coming from. It's in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 1 through 3. And it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us show, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. That's what we're going to be speaking about here this morning. For the joy that set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. When you set out to run a race or when you set out to do really anything in life that's worth doing, you have to set a goal. We have to set resolutions like what Rick was talking about in week one. We have to set a goal and we have to fix our eyes on that goal. We're not going to get anywhere that's worth going to. We're not going to do anything that's worth us doing if we don't do it with intentionality. If we don't do it, we're not going to get there by accident. You're not going to accidentally have a good marriage. You're not going to accidentally be good parents or accidentally be good children. You're not going to accidentally have relationships that are edifying to one another, that are lifelong friendships. You're not going to accidentally be a good employee or a manager or a business owner. And so this passage is telling us that we can fix our eyes on Jesus. We can see what it looks like for us to set out on this race and have a target that we can aim for. And so that begs us to have this question, how did Jesus live? What are we fixing our eyes on? And so I wanna look at three different things. We're gonna look at how Jesus called disciples. We're gonna look at how Jesus connected with the Father. And we're gonna look at how he was concerned for others. So we're going to start with how he called disciples. We're even going to look at the passage where he called the first disciples. It's in Matthew chapter number four and verse 18 through 22. And here's what it says. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So I want you to picture this scene with me. These guys, they were business owners. And in fact, it was family business. Peter and Andrew were brothers, James and John, and their dad, Zebedee, they were brothers and father, son. And they had these businesses, these family businesses that they were operating. And they were, these businesses were fishing. So they know about fishing. They know everything that there is that you can possibly know about fishing, where to fish, what kind of fish you need, what kind of nets and boats you need to use. They know different 
techniques that you need to use. They spent their lives fishing. They would spend all evening fishing. Then they would spend the next day cleaning and maintaining and repairing their boats and their sails and their nets and their anchors and all of the pieces that make this business. This is what they were doing. They knew where to sell. They knew how to have relationships with people in town in the market on how to make the most out of this. And at the end of the day, they made some kind of a profit. They made something to be able to provide for themselves, to be able to provide for their families, money to be able to put back into their business. They were tradesmen. They were professionals at what they were doing. And I labor on about all of that because at the end of the day, why would it matter when a carpenter walks along and says, hey, let me teach you how to fish. You're you're not a fisherman. And yet they stopped. At minimum, they were curious. They wanted to gain understanding. Why would this carpenter want me to follow him? And they end up following him. They end up taking their eyes, instead of being fixed on fish and on their business, and they fix it on Jesus. And they allow him to influence their next step on where it is that they may want to go. While they're left with so many unknowns, they left their income, they left the stability, they left their known to step into an unknown to follow him. They left their relationships, the proximity to their family, so many things that they stepped away and they left. I had a very similar experience in my own life. Before I had this position here at church, I worked for a family business as well. And with that family business, I became pretty proficient at what we did. We could put out a good product. We could put it out efficiently. In addition to that, there would actually be people that would come from all around the world to Ankeny, Iowa, to come to our little garage, basically, and learn how to do what we do the way that we do it. It was known. It became familiar. It became something that I enjoyed. It became stability for our family. Then one day I received a phone call from Pastor Rick and he and Pastor Jared wanted to take me out to lunch. Just a sidebar, if one pastor asks you to lunch, you're good. If two pastors ask you to lunch, you might wanna ask some more questions on what they're up to. They asked me to lunch and what I saw, what happened and as I look in the rear view, I see that God had so many steps in my life that he was moving where if my eyes were fixed on him, I could see that he was moving the position of my life. He was moving the direction of where I was. While I was at this business, I had my eyes fixed on Christ. He was able to use me within that business. He was able to use the things that the business brought to the table, but I had a decision to make. Am I gonna keep my eyes fixed on him as he is going a different direction? Or am I gonna set my eyes on the business? Am I going to set my eyes on the financial security? Am I going to set my eyes on that I know what's going to happen next all the time with the business? Am I going to set my eyes on the familiarity and the known? And as I looked and I fixed my eyes, I was given an invitation. Lay down the known, step into the unknown. Some of us, that's a big unknown. Some of us, that's a small unknown, what that may look like and where that is. That's exactly similar where Peter and Andrew and James and John were at in this. They had to leave their known. They had to leave their stability to fix their eyes on Jesus and to become part of his community, part of his inner circle, part of a group. So when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we find ourselves becoming part of a community. We see that he was calling disciples. The other thing that we do when we fix our eyes on Jesus is we see that he was connecting with the Father. I want to show you a verse, Luke chapter number six, verse 12. It's just one verse and it says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and he spent all night praying to God. Jesus took time to connect to the Father Even though he was God in flesh, it was still God that was sustaining him, sustaining him physically in the same way that he sustains you and me. We woke up this morning, we're here, we're in our homes, we're online watching. He's sustaining the breath in our lungs, our beating hearts, and in the same way that he sustains us 
to be on the path that he has for us, to be at the jobs that we have, to be in the family, families that we're in, to guide and lead in the families that we're in. God sustains us. And so Jesus was connecting to the Father in this moment. Now, every time that Jesus connected to the Father, it wasn't an all-nighter. In fact, we're told in one chapter earlier that he oftentimes withdrew, secluded himself temporarily to connect to the Father. He left the good work that was before him to go and do the most important work, to connect to God. And it's just one verse, but I like to call these verses little rhythm reminders because it's all the other things around that get all the attention. Because in the midst of this verse, Jesus had been healing. He had healed a paralyzed man. He had healed a man of leprosy. He had healed somebody with a deformed arm. He had done all of this healing. In the midst of where this little verse is, we find that he was teaching. Teaching is kind of a scary thing. It's kind of an exhausting thing. I've prepared a lot for just a short, few short minutes up, <laughs> up here this week. He was constantly teaching. He was constantly out pouring into other people. He was calling other disciples like we just talked about. And like, that's the untalked about miracle, right? Of making new friends in your 30s. Like we could all talk about that a little bit more, I think. He's in the midst of all of this. And then he's causing a disturbance. The religious people weren't happy with the way that he was doing things, the rules that he wasn't following. So now he's taking criticism. Their people are trying to catch him in the midst of these like spiritual traps and contortion and whatnot. And this is where we find this verse, right in the middle of all of this, that he took time to connect to the Father. And it's that time that's important. It's the seclusion that's important. If there's any moms in here or online, especially moms of little kids, it's like constant, like, where's my Nintendo? I need help. I want that. I'm hungry. Uh-oh. All these things constantly. Jesus is in the middle of a ministry. It's all these things and all these people constantly moving around, constantly buying for his attention. And it's that seclusion. That seclusion where a mom can hear her own thoughts where Jesus can hear his own thoughts, where he can hear from the Father. So we see that Jesus was calling disciples. We see that Jesus was connected to the Father. And the last thing we see is that Jesus was concerned with others. I wanna look at a passage in Matthew, it's chapter nine, verse number 19 through 13, or nine through 13, I'm sorry. And it says this, it says, as Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told them. And Matthew got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and they ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So here we see Jesus, he's out and about. He comes across a man named Matthew, who's a tax collector. Now we've talked a lot about tax collectors in here, but just to bring everybody up to speed, tax collectors, much like the tax collectors of our day, are not really society's favorite people. In this day, they didn't just collect the taxes though. They increased what was told to be collected. And then they kept what they increased with. And that would be enough to make you frustrated, but then they were protected by the Roman government. So they could do what it was that ever they wanted to do and you couldn't do a thing about it. And this is what Matthew calls his job and does all day, every day. And Jesus, when he comes across Matthew's path, he slows down and instead of giving him a piece of his mind, like everybody else before him, he gave him time. He showed him that he was known, that he was valued, that he was loved. I guess you could use less words and say that he mattered while everyone else maybe even would have loved to see his death, Jesus says, I wanna use your life. You have something you can do with your life. Unfortunately, we don't get to hear that conversation. We get to see that he was offered an invite 
and he accepts that invite to follow Jesus. And then he does what most of us would do. When someone shows us so much value, you just want to celebrate them. And that's exactly what Matthew does. But the problem is, is Matthew doesn't have most normal friends like you and I. Matthew's friends are more tax collectors and more people who make horrible decisions. And that's who's at this party. That's who Matthew invites. And then he invites Jesus to come. He says, tell, tell them that part that you told me. Show, show them what you showed me. Tell them how this goes. And Jesus broke every social norm that could have existed at that time to make sure that he was at that party, to make sure that he was telling them what he told Matthew, to make sure that they knew they were loved and cared for and that they were important. And that same message cast down to you guys all here today. Jesus, he cares more about what the tax collectors and the sinners and each and every person thinks about him than what they think about the rules, what they think about these societal norms. And none of this comes naturally, which is why we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. We have to see the person who pioneered and perfected this race that we attempt to run today. We're gonna take a break from teaching. Pastor Dan's gonna come back and he's gonna help us apply these things. We're gonna have our prayer team down here as well as we sing songs that are, that are prayers, they're praises from our hearts to his. If you wanna pray with someone, if you need prayer, come on down here. We'd love to pray with you. But before we do, I have one question I wanna leave you with. It can be summed up in this whole series, but especially in this moment, I want you to ask yourself, if you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at yourself and you're looking at your faith. I want you to ask you this. Is my faith more about what God is gonna do for me? Or is my faith gonna be more about what God is gonna do through me? Well, thank you worship team and uh, Brandon for uh, helping us sort of set the table, if you will, for what Jesus modeled. Um, not only is it a, sometimes a nice churchy things, but what I love about what we're talking about today, it's very real, it's very practical, and it's very sustainable. So when Jesus in Matthew 4 is recruiting his small group, yes, they were his disciples, um, here's a little quandary I have, and yet I've discovered the truth behind it, but follow me here for a second. Um, Jesus is the son of God not a normal person, even though he was fully God and fully man. He has healed a lame, as Brandon talked about. He had uh, restored sight to the blind and he walked on water. I haven't done that in a while. So did he need people? The small group, this connecting in community, if you will. Well, he did. And here's some of the brilliant ways that not only was it effective and efficient, as well as personal and practical. A few things that I realize when you live in community or connecting community with people, it's the best way to learn. Some of us went, went to school. Some of us love school, right? In the front row right here, we love school, don't we? We love it, love it, love high school. It's the best ever. Not me, but I'm trying to encourage the guys in the front row here. Some of us went to college, right? And it took some time to grasp some of those deep truths of education. Um, Jesus needed to help change their whole paradigm. And you don't go to class for that. You go and recruit people and say, hey, let's go hang out. Let's do life together. And you guys know it's true because if you've ever been in an organization or department where you took like a conference, right? Overnight kind of thing. Maybe you did a family trip with extended family. Maybe you went on a hunting or fishing trip. Maybe uh, you did a woman's conference and you traveled together. If you drove, you know you heard a whole lot of stories when you drive. Sometimes you fly, but you eat together. You sleep, maybe sharing the same room. Maybe you have a hotel you share. But listen, you and I both know you learn about people in ways you never, ever can orchestrate or manipulate. There's some things you learn, some things you wish you didn't know, right? When you take those kind of things. I remember taking a family trip with all the showers. So my Grandparents, Papa and Mama Shouts, that's what we call them. My dad, both my uncles and all their families. We stayed one of those once in a lifetime kind of events. We rented a beach house down in the Redneck Riviera. I mean, Gulf Shores, that's what we call it in the South. 
And uh, I remember as a teenage boy, I was probably 14, 15, I had never heard and felt such a loud snoring in my whole life. I could not sleep the whole night. Those are the kind of things you both know and experience. Some things you do, some things you don't. But if you want to learn quickly, go hang out. Literally eat together, sleep together, travel together. And what Jesus is trying to implement into their lives stuck like no other better method ever. The other thing we see that Jesus model in community is the best way to live. What do I mean by that? The best way to live is this real life happens. You and I both know either you're in that season, it's hard, or maybe you remember back to that season or the reality is it's about to happen to you. Real life happens. And when I'm reading through this again, Jesus, the son of God, he has the powers as you really need people. And let me tell you how much we know that God says to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love others. But Jesus so brilliantly and lovingly did this. When he brought his small group, his disciples together, he was equipping them, right? They were learning together, living together, but he knew they needed to do life together because one day all the things that he would talk about would come to fruition. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be crucified and he was going to be buried. And Jesus so graciously for two and a half, three years bonded this group together that when it happened, it's not the disciples finest moment, but track with me here. Do you remember what happened when Jesus is crucified and buried? Scripture says they went to a room, locked the door and hid. Not their best moment, but here's what I want you to see. They were together. They were together because he knew they had not, they'd heard and saw a bunch of stuff, but they haven't applied it yet. Thus, they were confused and scared to death, took off and hid and locked the door, but they did it together because that's what it takes when we live life together. The other thing I know about living in community is the best way to grow and multiply. I mean, Christianity has grown for 2000 years. Why? Because when you're in the front row living life together, it's not a book that you read. You have seen it firsthand. We know the gospels aren't stories somebody wrote. They're watching, they're eyewitness accounts. You wanna grow something? Do it in a healthy way because healthy things grow. That is the best model by which to grow. We know that in the business world, great leaders and execs hire people out of great leaders and great teams, right? It works all the time because they want to reproduce what they've seen in you. Now, I want you to help me this morning with sort of a practical way of connecting or living in community. And online audience, you guys can do the same thing. From your home, you can answer a question for me. Actually, I got four or five, but here's the, the, the distinct thing I want you to hear. Do not raise your hand until the end. Everybody hear that? Raise them at the end when I ask you to, but I want to illustrate this. It's very easy and simple, but it's pretty profound. Nobody raise their hand, but answer one of these questions to yourself, and then I'll ask. Have you ever experienced loss of a spouse, of a child, someone close to you, a classmate, have you ever experienced a broken relationship? A boyfriend, a girlfriend, a divorce? Have you ever experienced loss of a job where you have no income? Have you ever experienced sickness to the point where you needed help? Have you ever wrestled with anxiety and depression? Have you ever felt that you don't really matter and you question whether you even have purpose? If you've answered any of those questions with the word yes, myself included, would you raise your hand online? Show it. You can do that. Yeah, like 99.9% .9 of us. Why? And I would say I'm not raising my hand to prompt you. Everyone but one is true in my life. Lori would say the same thing because Jesus knew this. 
He didn't just do this and say, and then figure it out. No, no, he modeled everything. That's why we fix our eyes on Jesus. It wasn't something so far-fetched we can't comprehend and understand. This stuff works. And then how do we do that at Capital City Church? Well, this is part of it. I mean, this is the family. This is church. But to go a little deeper into small groups, into community, we do city groups. Everything city. City kids, city youth, city serve, and city groups. And they're smaller groups of 10 to 12. And we do life together. We talk about what Pastor Rick talks about on stage, how to apply that to our life. Not another Sunday school lesson, but how do we wrestle with these and apply these things in our lives? And when we do life, we celebrate the seasons of your life that's great. And we will come alongside of you when that season stinks. Why? (laughs) Because that's what community does. And you can register for that. Um, Go to our Capital City Church app, click on the upcoming events. You can register for City Group. Miss Kathy Logan, if you're here in the, in the flesh here, she will be at a table back in the back and you can sign up for city groups. Let me encourage you to take a step and we'll talk more about that towards the end. So not only did uh, Jesus model living or connecting in community, he gave us an example of how to um, connect with the father. How did Jesus connect with the father? Um, he gives us a couple illustrations One thing that uh, when I think about how to uh, how to how to wrestle with God really is that that power source. So Jesus, Jesus is God the Son, but He says to us, "I am doing and about my Father's will." So He has to stay connected, not like a plug-in, but almost like a Wi-Fi signal. And if we're not close in proximity to the signal, which is our Heavenly Father, Jesus modeled this. We get into doing our thing and not his thing through us. And that's a little bit of a churchy thing, but you, I'm going to flesh this out a little bit. So how did Jesus model connecting with the Father? First of all, he modeled things that you and I can do the same thing. He asked for direction. What's going on? Lord, I need help in my decisions, my priorities, my relationships. Jesus did that. But Brandon talked about beforehand. He spent all night before he chose the 12. Like, it's a big deal. I know that in a supernatural way, not a natural way, staying connected to the Father is how, as a follower of Jesus, I live a supernatural life and not a natural life. The other thing that he did, that Jesus model was it was a time of refreshment. If you're a follower of Jesus and live out how Jesus modeled not only loving God, but loving others, you know that you are giving, you're serving. There are seasons you're enduring, man, because it's hard. And you've got to get away alone to connect with the Father for a time of refreshment. And then last, Jesus knew this because it's his power source. He had to get alone to reconnect, to stay in alignment. Matthew 14 speaks of Jesus walking on water. But before he did that, he spent time with the Father. If you forget what happened that day, Brandon gave us uh, some insight to it. I want to remind us real quick. So that day in Matthew, he finds out his cousin has been beheaded. That's a bad day. Then he spends all day teaching to 5,000 plus people. If you've ever taught, led a conference or breakout, you know you're giving when you teach and it is tiring. And then, oh, by the way, the disciples are at the end. It's like, hey, we need to shut this thing down because we're hungry, they're hungry, and we need to go home. And Jesus says, nope. We're going to feed everybody. So by the end of this day, they're tired. (laughs) They're not really sure what the next direction is because we aren't either when we're tired. They definitely were, were spent. They had no refreshment. And Jesus says something very interesting before he walked on water. He says, disciples, you guys were tired. Go ahead and take the boat, take off. I'll catch up. I'm not sure what the disciples thought when they heard Jesus say that, but that's a sermon for another time. And Matthew tells us that as he sent the disciples off, because we, it was a long, stinking day, that he went up by himself in the mountain to pray, period. Later that night. So we knew feeding the 5,000 was somewhere around dinner time because that's what the disciples said. And we know now it's nighttime. So the point was, this was not a five minute, you know, help me pass a test or help my girlfriend fall in love with me. This was everything that we knew it to be. It was personal. It was deep. 
And Jesus modeled everything that we know that we need to do when it comes to connecting with the Father. Before he walked on water, he was in prayer, doing everything that we know he did and that we are to exemplify. People ask me all the time, hey, Dan, what's, is it better to like pray? I mean, prayer is talking to God, right? It's conversation, which is both talking and listening, by the way, you know that. But is it best to do it in the morning? Is it best to do it in the evening? Is it best to do it at my lunch break? Is it best to do it like right before I wake home and it's been a stressful day before I walk in the door? My answer every single time is yes. Yes, there's not a bad time. But here's, this is an old parenting phrase we used to use back when I was younger. In the quantity time, you will find quality. Jesus models this. He didn't get alone and take off for hours at a time or all night, every day, every week. But I know myself, I know I need that. He modeled that. And that is why a follower of Jesus has to stay connected to his power source. Another little food for thought. Jesus was so connected with his father that there were times and seasons that he went and healed one or two people, not everybody else. Hmm because he was living out his father's will, have to stay in alignment. And the last thing is not only connecting in community, staying connected with the father, but we all know this is not a new thing if you're a follower of Jesus, is concern for others, others focused. Jesus modeled it incredibly well. Brandon did a great job talking about the Matthew principle that we learned from here in Matthew 9. But I got to tell you, God uh, just sort of revealed something to me. It just sort of overwhelmed me. And I know that someone here needs to know somebody online needs it. Matthew, the tax collector. Nobody wanted him. Nobody did. It was the first time the Pharisees and the disciples were on the same page. Rome couldn't stand him because Rome was big and bad and they were all about loyalty. And while... Matthew, the tax collector, was giving them some money. <laughs> they couldn't stand a traitor. You did it in Rome, we'd kill you. So Rome didn't even appreciate it. Pharisees, the tax collector was below scum. Even the disciples, as they watched Jesus go recruit them, were like, he's a traitor. Nobody wanted Matthew on the team. Nobody, not a single vote, not a single hand. But here's what I love about Jesus. He didn't turn around and take a poll. He didn't say, oh, oh my gosh, what are people gonna think? Nobody wanted Matthew. But Jesus went right to him, said, hey, Matthew, you're on my team. <laughs> I love that. So how do we create this same appetite? How do we flesh this out as Jesus modeled for us when it comes to concern for others? I personally do this. I think Jesus did the same thing because he spent time with the Father. I need to prepare for people. Pray that God will prepare me for whomever crosses my path. I'm a task-oriented guy, and as Pastor Rick would say, if I'm not careful, people get in my way, and I don't see people on my way. The second thing is I want to just that. I want to see people. I want to be alert and aware of people. The planned meetings and the impromptu meetings become a, I'm a task oriented guy. I literally pray for every one of my meetings, every person I meet with every single day. And here's the nuance to the Dan, Mr. Analytical dude. And God, I need help preparing for people who come across my path to see them as an opportunity, not taking up my time. And then last, I want to value people. I want to make people feel like they are of value just like Jesus did. Some of you have a lie in your head or you're in a season of life where you feel just like Matthew. You don't really matter. You have a smile on your face, but inside you feel that nobody wants you on their team. 
Some of you feel like your future is just to survive. And I'm telling you, it's a life in the pit of hell. I've always read Matthew being the tax collector. I always knew everybody hated tax collectors, but this truth to me just overwhelmed me that nobody wanted Matthew except Jesus who said, come, follow me. Come be a part of my small group. Let's live life together. Let me show you things that'll blow your mind. Let me ask you a question. What's the first book in the New Testament? first book in the New Testament that we're reading through is Matthew. Because that's how my God works. And my encouragement to you today is, or challenge, depending on how you're wired, is to take a step. Just take a step. Maybe take another step. Maybe if this is all new to you, just take a step. Connecting community, make being a part of church a priority for you, for others around you, for your kids to model. Nobody cares about lip service. What do you hold as a priority in your life? Being a part of church, Jesus came for salvation, restoring our relationship to God, but he also came to start the church, not the building, not the sound and tech, this because when the church is being the church Jesus designed it to be, it's the most effective, efficient organism ever. And professionally, Lori and I do something called a coaching and leadership. And the reason I bring it up is because we use every one of these biblical principles. And when people know nothing about God, they look at us every single time, don't they, Lori? And they say, this is incredible how this stuff works. Because it ain't just a church thing. God created people. God created infrastructure. God knows this stuff works. So what about connecting with God? Your time with God, your reading and your prayer. Remember in quantity, you will find quality. Take a step, try, do, but take a step. And then concern for others, ask God, show me those you are putting across my path so I can help them feel like they have value just like Jesus modeled. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a, a deep day, a good day, but I, I pray an encouraging day. That as we listen and are reminded of how you modeled life, you didn't just tell us things, you showed us how to do it. And if folks are listening online or here today and they're questioning this whole God relationship with Jesus thing, I pray that they would seek you and ask you to reveal yourself because I know that you will. Maybe to ask one of us to walk or talk or to have coffee, to email, to talk about this relationship with Jesus, what it looks like. And Lord, for those who are followers of Jesus, my prayers today is that we don't take this lightly. We can't if we claim to be followers of Jesus. So I pray for my people, my prayer for me today as I prepared that you would give them fresh eyes to see where you are directing them. That you give them soft ears to hear the prompting of a heavenly father. <laughs> Just like Matthew says, trust me, follow me. And I will show you things that are beyond what you can ask, think, or imagine. And Lord, would you be with my friends just to develop a heart that we will risk, that we will trust you, that we will follow the unknown because while we don't know, we know good and well that you do. And walking by faith, taking action, being obedient is risking. But you have shown us time and time again that you are faithful and that you are true. And for whatever you decide to in and through our life, through those online, through our marriages, our families, our communities, and even our churches, we'll give you thanks and praise for how you do that in and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.